please now welcome up our next speaker, Ms. Julia Seitz, and her thesis, A Modest Proposal, A Reevaluation of the Christian Notion of Modesty. The story commences in bustling, busy New York City, in the bedroom of a young adult woman staring at her closet. The minute hand is tirelessly chasing the hour hand, waiting for her to make a decision. She picks out a flashy, revealing dress and looks into the mirror. She thinks she looks great and loves the way it caters to the shape of her body, but she knows deep down that she struggles with battling social, social standards versus God's standards, as do I since we are all sinners. Those two standards are like oil and water, constantly, constantly at odds with one another. As she leaves to grab her keys and her wallet, she sees her Bible on her bedside table. She pretends like she didn't see it because she knows that deep down that she struggles with battling that she knows that that dress was not glorifying God and honoring the body of Christ. But the Holy Spirit tugs at her heart and convicts her to change her outfit. With this new confidence founded in Christ, the, she goes back into her room and picks out a modest yet stylish outfit. Thoughts of wanting acceptance, thoughts of wanting attention, thoughts of wanting someone to think she's beautiful come swirling around her mind. Although she's considerably tempted by popular social standards, she is reminded of her worth in Christ and how valuable he thinks she is. She, uh, throughout this story of finding a modest approach in an ever-evolving world, the authority of Christ is embedded into her because of her desire to become a true Christian. But to a lesser extent, dressing modestly externally manifested the, inter the value of internal modesty of the heart. Modesty in its essence is first identified in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, and their eyes were opened to the knowledge of good and evil of this world. When God called out to them, their first instinct was to hide their naked bodies in shame. But before sin entered the world, Adam and Eve knew not that they were naked. But once they had knowledge of it, they were ashamed and ran away from God. St. Thomas Aquinas argues that modesty and clothing is something of an accommodation to sinfulness. Before the fall, Adam and Eve were modest in their nakedness because they did not use their bodies to manipulate others. And since Adam and Eve were pure internally, they did not need external constraints, and modesty was just merely unnecessary. But since we are all broken internally, we need external constraints to prevent ourselves from sinning. It is evident throughout time that modesty and clothing has changed consistently, culturally and regionally. Modesty is not based on curbing or enhancing one's attraction. Rather, modesty is recognizing the value of the body manifested through outward dress as a reflection of propriety, humility, and respect for oneself, others, and God. Christians presume that modesty is covering up oneself to keep the opposite sex from lusting. While this may seem like an effective method, it ultimately creates a legalistic ideology while the resp responsibility should not solely rest on the individual with how they cope with their lustful thinking. Rather, the Christian community should surround that person with encouragement and building them up in modesty. Many argue that they themselves are not responsible for another person's weakness. Because society furtively advises everyone to cater to the opposite sex, even to the extent of explicitly displaying one's body. Because America, inclu including some libertine Christians, have increased in sensual and vain desires. However, one's body must be adorned appropriately because, as described in God's word, our bodies are a holy temple. Evidence in scripture points to the to the inherent value of the body for Christians, pointing to the, to the necessity of modesty. Legalism, which is a sole dependence on law, is still prominent in Christian communities. At face value, it seems logical, but the reasoning behind it can be legalistic. Fellow Christians remind females especially to cover up, their, cover up so that their brothers in Christ will refrain from lusting. While this may fear, appear like an effective approach, it ultimately puts disproportionate pressure on females. On the contrary, those that would have lust and desire should guard their own hearts and minds. And this can be for everybody since we are all sinners. Paul in Romans narrated, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, so that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. With the word of the Lord in mind, Christians should re reflect a reflection of propriety, humility, and respect. Wendy Shalit, a Jewish-American conservative writer, has something to say with regards to modesty. It is powerful. 
but it should not be used to justify a man's failure to control himself, end quote. Modesty is not curbing or enhancing men's sexual attraction because he is lustful. Rather, it is humility and respect as a virtue shown externally through dress. True modesty has different aspects, and one of which is valuing one's body as a temple. Paul in 1 Corinthians stated, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. This adds to the claim about the adornment of one's body and being part of the church body of Christ. As interpreters of the Bible, Christians might be confused at first glance when Paul says our bodies are temples and filled with the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, God's people built a temple so that they can pray, worship, and communicate with him. When Christ died on the cross, the temple veil was torn, signifying that God's people no longer needed to be in one specific place to pray, communicate, and worship with him. Rather, they can be in God's presence everywhere and anywhere. Now in the verse to the Corinthians, the temple is a symbol towards one body, which houses the, their identity and persists forever thanks to the resurrection. If the body is that valuable, then Christians should rather be in awe of their own bodies as well as others, signifying the need for modesty. Just as a temple is holy and should not be profaned or shown off to outsiders, so also our body not ought be profaned and should be modest. Unfortunately, libertine Christians believe that they have freedom under Christ with no obligation to follow the law, and they use their freedom as a, as a license for all sorts of liberties, pursuits, and activities. As they exercise what they think is their newfound freedom in Christ, they reject modesty because it is seen as a barrier to the pleasures of this world. But... Since Christians' bodies are described as temples, so too does one's body represent the body of the church. In this comparison, one can see the urgent need and desire to practice humility and respect for God, others, and oneself. Many argue that they themselves are not responsible for another person's weakness. For example, they claim that a man who struggles with lust and impure thoughts is accountable for his own thoughts and actions, and women play no part. Women feel as if men are excused for having disordered desires, and women have to suffer the effects, resulting in disproportionate pressures or responsibility. There is value that men should be held accountable for their thoughts and not indulging the lust of the eye, because it is their own thoughts and actions which should make them rely on Christ. However, as a Christian, one is part of the church body of Christ, and they are commanded to not cause one another to stumble, but to build one another up. Paul exhorted to the Romans, let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. Paul proclaims, therefore, let us not pass judgment or, on one another any longer, but rather decide to never put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. Paul calls Jews and Gentiles alike to heed and internalize, the, to encourage and build one another up in Christ, and to not cause one another to stumble. To the church in Corinth, Paul continued to address aiding one's neighbor and commanded, but take care that this right of yours does not become a stumbling block to the weak. At face value, keeping to oneself and minding one's own business may seem like an easy lifestyle, but it is evident that aiding others, especially brothers and sisters in Christ, is a healthier, modest lifestyle. Christians should adopt this way of thinking because of the benefits it brings by aiding those that are struggling in their sins. Because modesty is a tool in which Christians can help one another. In the Christian community, one should always be mindful of those that struggle. This is different than shoving the responsibility on females because Christians must be others-minded, not given mandates to follow. If one believes the world revolves around them, then they have made themselves gods. One must not fall into this trap of self-righteousness because it will lead down a path of immodesty. All Christians alike should heed and internalize that true biblical modesty is a matter of the heart. Understanding that is crucial to the betterment of the church body of Christ. Once Christians understand the value, worth, and duty of being part of this church body of Christ, then living a modest lifestyle will follow suit. An inversion of this God-ordained order, internal than external, is not modesty at all, rather a perversion and misapplication of its principles. For to minimize modesty to the hem of a skirt or to the exposure of a shoulder is to miss its entire purpose to be the truest indicator of a life wanting to serve, glorify, and honor the Creator. 
Together we stand to encourage one another. Together we stand for a greater purpose. Together we stand as one in Christ. Thank you. Thank you.